Yavanna spoke before the Valar, saying, Ye mighty of Arda, the vision of Iluvatar was brief and soon taken away, so that maybe we cannot guess within a narrow count of days the hour appointed. Yet be sure of this, the hour approaches, and within this age our hope shall be revealed and the children shall awaken. Shall we then leave the lands of their dwelling desolate and full of evil? Shall they walk in darkness while we have light? Shall they call Melkor Lord while Manwe sits upon Tani Quetel? Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe, here means my co-host Dan. Hello and greetings. Today, as you may have guessed, we begin our discussion of the Westward's March of the Elves and the awakening of them. This is one of my favorite parts of the book. Everything outside of Amon is cast in darkness as the trees are newly grown and the promontories and mountains of Valinor block their light from the outside world. Yavanna and Arome alone who venture forth into Arda in order to either go exploring or to otherwise try to replant and rebuild what they once built. During the eclipses that take place, Melkor consolidates his forces and creates countless monsters and demons assemble in a tomb now, and he corrupts many Maiar into Balrogs. Melkor, though, would construct a new fort in the northwest shores, which he put under the command of Sauron. This fortress was called Angband. So we can see here that Sauron is steward of Angband, while Fankil is steward of Atumno. Obviously, both are to play separate and yet equal important roles. Although Fankill is not mentioned in the Silmarillion, I'm going to the Lost Tales for that, as I rather like Fankill, and I consider him part of the canon. You could take it as you like there. But ultimately, realizing the danger that's looming, Yavanna calls for a council, wherein she denounces the current policy and says, you know, we gotta venture out there. What the heck are you doing, guys? Why are you cowering behind your high walls and mountains? Go out there, and if I don't see you in five minutes fighting out there, there's gonna be hell to pay. At which point, Tolkast is cheers and goes, yeah, let's go out there. Enough of this. <laughs> Varda, meanwhile looking out from Tani Quetel, assembles dew taken from Telperion, the one of the trees of light, and throws it into the air and uses this dew to create the stars, which is the first sight the elves actually see when they awaken. And these elves are Imin, Iminye, who would become his wife, Tata and Tatie. You have Enel and Enalye, which their names roughly translate as for Imin. First, Tata, second, and Enel third. The thing with Emin is that Tata and Enal is that they start to travel around and try to gather companies of elves. The first group they find, I think, joining Emin, then the next one joins Tata, and then you've got an elf. So they assemble different numbered groups of elves, basically calling dibs on who they're going to be accepting to their clan. The first group, that of Emin, numbered 14, and they would always remain a small company, and they would later become the Vanyar. Second company would become the Noldor, and they numbered 56. And the third company, and largest, and they'd become the Teleri. The interesting thing about the Teleri, though, is they split almost in two, I think, between Olwe and Elwe. Therefore, we, the Teleri are at first 72, which means probably 36 Teleri and 36 Sindar. I'm just theorizing here. The elves would, they first focus on just wandering around. They don't head immediately west. The sleep that had been cast on them was cast by Iluvatar, and the first of the Valar to become aware of them was Melkor, and he took precautions to try and corrupt some, get others in the dark of night, and otherwise scare them, get them to fear the Valar. The elves would always adore Elbereth, or Varda, Alentari, because of their great love for the stars, which is something they have in common with the author. And the first place that the elves established as their own would be known as Quivianen, and this place would always hold a special place in the hearts of the elves, though they'd abandon it. It's known as the Place of Awakening, and it's in the northeast of Middle-earth, or at least that's the suspicion. There was a bay in the Inland Sea near where Mount Iluin was, and end up engaging in vast wanderings. They'd make speech at this time, name themselves the Quendi. They would only be found by Orome, when he was hunting nearby, quite by accident, he would name the elves the Eldar in their language, with the elves originally in the early days being stronger and taller than they would be in later days. 
the majority of the elves would fear his coming and it would take some mollifying with some Quendi wandering away. Well, these elves who wandered off never returned. The rumor was that the hunter had tracked them and killed them. When Arome comes to them, he'd be in the middle of a hunt. The most courageous and noble of the elves would be drawn by his light. It's kind of a fluke, but also a few of them looking at this great figure emanating light and just being drawn in by him. You know, like moths to a flame in a way. As to those captured by Melkor, many of them were thrown into the pits of Atumno. Doubtlessly, few ever came back. And those imprisoned were frequently broken and deformed and made to breed orcs. The orcs, in turn, it's noted, loathe Melkor because they're afraid of him, fear him too much, ever really rebel. Arome, though, would tarry amongst the elves for a time before he returned to the Valar who would rejoice and then Arome would come back and say, you know, we really would like to have you guys come over. It'll be great. You'll love Valinor. This decision, though, was decided at a council called by Manwe over in Amman. Ulmo immediately rejected the idea that they should invite the elves into Valinor. He said, nope, bad idea. You're just going to overawe the elves. Like, this is just going to end badly for everyone. The elves were created to live in Middle-earth. They should live in Middle-earth. They should not be taken into paradise because their destiny lies with Middle-earth. Ulmo, though, is an outvoted, and he leaves very, very unhappy. The way it's worded in the history of Middle-earth about his disagreements with the rest of the Valar over this, it's rather heavy-handed what the Valar are doing, and Ulmo considers it very heavy-handed and disrespectful towards the elves, and that they're removing the consent of the elves in a way, by overawing them. I rather like that. That's an interesting way of looking at it. The Valar argue this is paradise, but Ulmo sees it as it's only paradise if everyone's happy and if they agree to it. You're promising them everything, but how do you know you can deliver? You're taking too much for granted. There's no way it's going to go as planned. The decision is reached that they will invite the elves, but first they got to do something about Melkor. Tolkas is more than happy to get even with Melkor. They end up waging their war to capture Melkor. Problem is that the Valar waged this war for the elves, and he would never forgive them for it. It just shows how petty he is. What did the elves have to do with this? He's evil. The Valar end up arriving, sieging Utumno, and that's called the War of the Powers. And it shook the earth and made even the heavens quake. There was heavy fighting right outside of the gates of Atumno. During the Great War, the Great Sea sundered Middle-earth from Amman even more. And many lesser bays were created during this era between the Great Bay and Helgaroxai. But the gates of Atumno were eventually broken down and Melkor took refuge in the innermost pit where Tolkas wrestled him down and enchained him with Unganor, which Ali had forged right before the battle. The trouble is... The Valar did not do what they were supposed to do and did not search every pit like they should have. They pretty much took the attitude, got Melkor. Good job, well done, let's go home. Sauron and Fankill are still on the loose. The Balrogs are on the loose. A lot of demons are on the loose. The demon wolves are on the loose. Werewolves are on the loose. Monsters are on the loose. There are still elves in those pits. But damn, we did a great job here. Okay, now that he's out of Utumno, what, what next? They do break down some of the fortress, but the trouble is they don't search it pit to pit. They don't finish the job. Be Fankill, meanwhile, rallies what forces are nearby. Sauron's really the one who takes command more than Fankill. And Sauron ends up rallying the forces near Angban. Of course, the right-hand men escape, rally the forces. And in time, Fankill's dispatched east where he's going to find the humans. And he'll start causing trouble over there for them. In turn, though, Sauron pretty much starts rebuilding Angban almost immediately because it was also semi-broken down but it starts getting repaired immediately becomes bigger and badder than ever before melkor in turn though is dragged and blindfolded into valinor where he's thrown into the ring of doom and it is there with his face pressed against his feet and his buttocks in the air rather humiliating that he's presented at the feet of manway's throne and is made to beg for pardon which he does and he pinky promises never to do anything bad again and oh those fingers crossed behind his back oh don't look at that he pinky promised and you know no one ever breaks a pinky promise melkor would be imprisoned in valinor for three whole ages oh poor melkor imprisoned in paradise for three whole ages what should he ever do
and he's put it in close proximity to the elves. This war was fought to keep him away from the elves, but then they imprison him right next door to them. Honestly, <laughs> the logic. Every time I've seen this kind of thing in a fantasy story, fight everyone in the rear, and you always have one person that says, no, let's finish the job. We need to go chase them down. In this case, it's two people, Tolkas and Olmo. Now, Tolkas is too loyal to defy Manway's orders. Olmo sees it as there's nothing he can do. Because if he were to interfere, it might end up flooding him on, and no one wants that. So might as well just accept your losses and prep for what's to come. That's all he can do at this point. Mandos is one of them that announces that assembling the elves in Valinor is doomed. Mandos also sees where things are going to go. And he just says, I'm warning you guys, it's not going to end well. But, of course, as always, Mandos is ignored. It's the thing you do with a prophet. What's also interesting is that this is the first time Mandos lays down one of his dooms. This is the first time he gives a warning saying an idea is a bad one. And the Valar ignore him, just as Feanor later would. Which, I wonder if there's maybe a commentary there about the hubris of the Valar. Just as there was commentary there about him warning Feanor of the dangers of Feanor doing what he wanted. And him warning Feanor against the vice of vanity and the arrogance behind his decisions. At the beginning, as said, the elves were afraid of Arome, but Arome comes to them to negotiate. And there are three elves who say, you know what? We'll act as ambassadors. They are Ingwe, Finwe, and Elwe. And each of their fates would be markedly different from one another. Because to go to Amon would end pretty well for Ingwe. Finwe's doom lies along that path, and Elwe will never make it to Amon alive. Each of them will be crowned kings, but each of them were also friends with each other. This friendship would end up being something that would bring a great deal of joy to Elway in time, as it'd be during one of his visits to, to Finway that he'd run into the love of his life, Melian. But that'll come next chapter. Now, the elves elected these three as their ambassadors. All three of them would prove themselves three great kings. They'd go to Amon, become odd, come back, and they would then be crowned kings, much to Emin's fury, as the first of the elves was angered at being dethroned by Ingwe. Not that Ingwe fought him, it's just the elves said, yeah, we have an elective monarchy, you're out. These guys are in. The first chief was not impressed. That said, many of the elves who refused to go on this great journey, which took many uh, years, would be called the Avari, or the Unwilling. And the first elves to reach Valinor would be the Vanyar. And the Vanyar are favored by Varda and Manwe, and they'd settle at the feet of Tani Quetel once they did reach Valinor. Next came the Noldor, who were led by Finwe, and they'd be favored by, and favor in turn, Aule. Aule would show them many a different arts. The friendship between the Noldor and Aule would yield a great deal of good. Some bad, admittedly, but a lot of good. The last host would be the Teleri, or Sea Elves. And they kind of had two lords. One was Elwe Singolo, or King Grey Mantle, or as his fans know him, Elu Thingol. Thingol will never reach Amon alive, as I said. And later, when he ended up missing in action for a time, kind of disappeared in the forest for a time, but his brother Olwe would be a great leader. Olwe would be the one who would lead some of the Teleri into Amon. But the Sea Elves would never abandon their love for the sea and Olmo, and they would ultimately craft their swan boats and stick to the shores of Amon. And in a lot of cases, they'd stick to the shores of Middle-earth. With a lot of them also staying on the mainland, and those who stayed closer to the forests, intermingled with the other elves that stayed in Middle-earth, would become the Sindarin. Sindar elves would be ruled by Elwe. As for the Calaquendi, that's the title assigned to those who made it to Valinor, and they'd be called the Elves of Light. Now, as said, most Teleri either stopped before the sea or in the woods. Those who never reached Amon were nicknamed by the Calaquendi the Moriquendi, which means Dark Elves. There is a prejudice between the different races of elves that eventually arises in Middle Earth. Now, a lot of these prejudices, though, would be wiped away by the end of the First Age, as most of the elves still in Middle Earth would mingle together, end up ruled by Gil-galad. So really, these little differences between the elves, of who went to Valinor, who didn't, ends up being almost meaningless long term. Almost. Not quite. But it does have some importance amongst the elves. Because those who made it to Valinor end up being a lot more powerful than the rest, except in some small cases. 
But those who never made it or were born after the return of the Noldor to Middle-earth could end up as powerful as some of the earlier elves in some cases, such as Elrond, and they do end up wielding a lot of influence, and they all intermingle with each other pretty frequently. By the time the elves reach Anduin the Great, it's been a great deal of years that have passed, and the, the elf known as Lenwe would lead away some of his people who became known as the Nandor. The As for the Vanyar and Noldor, they would cross the Arid Luin first, arriving in Balerion. And you have a close friendship that was born between, as stated, Elwe and Finwe, the people at the end of this chapter stopping in the east of Balerion. A very majestic chapter, but the greatest majesty is still yet to come. It's almost a quiet chapter. There's very little that truly that's titanic that happens outside the Battle of Altumno. But there's a lot that can be discussed. The Blue Mountains, it's interesting because blue is a color that means eternity, truth, royalty. The first two to cross it are the Vanyar and the Noldor, who end up yielding a great deal of royal lines. They truly end up fighting for a long time, almost for eternity, or what can be termed a small eternity against the forces of evil. They end up very married to the notion and the ideal of truth. And there's also the fact that the first thing they saw was the stars. And there's some beautiful artwork out there where you see the first awakening elves looking off in awe at the first stars. This is where I'm going to say this. We were harsh on the Valar early in the video and earlier videos, but I actually think they did do a lot. They did yeah. a lot to help the elves. Let's actually give them credit because they were currently working overtime. They created the stars. They battled Melkor. They tore down a good chunk of his main fort. Melkor cannot recover everything from there. So they did do a lot. They knocked down for a time Angband. But we also get the feeling that given that there's parts of the continent that are destroyed and whatnot, there's a reason why the Valar are very reluctant to engage in open warfare with Melkor. Melkor is willing to do that. But whenever the Valar do it and they fight Melkor directly, continents sink, oceans are created. Who knows how many life forms are destroyed? Too much collateral. Yeah, and the Valar are concerned about collateral. They want to protect Middle-earth, not destroy it. If you end up destroying the world you want to protect from Melkor, what was the point? They needed to search Atumna. They did not complete the job, as you stated. This failure to search every pit in Atumna shows that the Valar are not infallible. That they have a tendency towards laziness. So, there's a great deal of understanding of human nature. It's not just the Valar who are divided. Now, one criticism that's frequently lobbied against Tolkien is that his elves are too perfect. But in reality, they're probably the most flawed out there in fiction, with his elves early on showing a great deal of division. It's interesting that we have a clash at the beginning between the elves for kingship. You've got Imin who says, I should be king. I already declared myself king. You have the elves. We don't want one overall king over all of us. We are electing three kings for each of our clans because we can't fully agree on who should be the overall leader. So we'll just divide into our original three clans. You've got Ingwe, which will lead one clan. Finwe will lead another. Elwe, and later Olwe, who will lead another. Works, but it's interesting that they, they were originally one. They divide into different clans, and then they will reunite later under the leadership of Gilgalad. And the interesting thing about Gilgalad is that he is the son of Orodreth, who is a son of Finarfin, and Finarfin is descended from Ingwe and Finwe. What that means is that Imin's descendant will reunite the elves under his banner. And, and I can't help but wonder if Gilgalad's mother is supposed to be relative of Elwe and Olwe or something. Because then it would tie it together with the descendant of all three clans having kind of brought them back together during the Second Age. Already we're seeing a breaking amongst the elves. Their first king was unworthy, so they threw him over. But basically he left unhappy and angry and all but cursing his people. It's not like the Roman founding myth where you have an automatic surge of civil war and strife between two different factions embodied in Romulus and Remus. But we do have an immediate break between the various elves. They are different fundamentally. There's also something to be said about moving from east to west. It reminds me of the way history moved because call Egypt and the Middle East the cradle of civilization. Classical culture was born in Greece and from Greece it moved eastwards into the Middle East and Egypt because of Alexander the Great and then it moved westwards when the Romans brought it over to their own lands. And from there, classical culture would move north and west 
words and intermingle with the local societies and cultures. So English culture was born from a amalgamation of Roman, Welsh, Britonic, Anglo-Saxon, French, even to an extent German and Dutch cultures, all thrown into a pot together over the course of many centuries, pretty much two millennia. Often what happened with England, east to west, the east came in and colonized England. And I'm calling everything east of England east here. I think that there is a cultural nod there, that that's where humanity and the elves kind of come from. We've analyzed the color blue, analyzed, I think, most of this chapter into the pavement. There's probably going to be more analysis that we'll do at a later date on individual details in later videos. And next time we'll get more into Elway and one character who's my favorite of the Astari, Melian. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash that like and smash that subscribe button like your Melkor slaying Finway.